You can be seated, and just so that you can um, find the scripture with me when I get there, I want you to go ahead and go to a great story in, uh, in the book of 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 23, that talks about a man that went into a pit and killed a lion on a snowy day. And uh, that's a story you probably haven't heard much preaching about in your lifetime, but today we're going to go there to the story of Benaiah in the Bible. Everyone say Benaiah. There is a name you don't hear very often. But I want to start this out while you're finding your scripture with a couple of questions. The first question I have is, have you ever felt stuck? Have you ever felt that you were just hedged in and no matter what you tried, you could not get yourself out of the situation you were in? It doesn't mean that you didn't try hard. It doesn't mean that you didn't do right things. It doesn't mean that you didn't push yourself or exert yourself. It just means that with all of the efforts that you put forward, you still found yourself stuck in a place you didn't want to be. Anyone ever been there besides me? I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. And, and, and in that place, you feel like it doesn't matter where I go, if I turn right or left or forward or backwards, the scenario is always the same. I end up here. I, I, I tried this, but I still ended up here. I, I pushed for this, and I still ended up here. No matter how many times I tried to change, no matter how many times I tried to pray it through, I'm still stuck in a battle I don't want to be in. I'm stuck in a place, and I want to be free. Is there anyone this morning who would say, Pastor, I want to be free from something that has me bound? I want to be free from something in my mind. I'd love to wipe it out of my mind forever and be done with it. Well, you're the one that the Lord has sent me on assignment to today. Because as a pastor, I have watched too many people live out cycles of pain to where they would get free for a while and something would trigger them and they'd fall back into the same temptation. Before you know it, they're repeating the worst chapter of their life over again. And then they get free for a while and they do good for a while and they have a testimony and they give up, you know, get up and give their testimony how good God is and how good things are going. And the next thing you know, something triggers them and that trigger creates their fear again and that fear creates their indulgences again. And from those indulgences, the next thing you know, they're right back in the same shape they were in before and they keep like, they keep reading the same bad chapter of their own life over and over and over again. Not only that, I have watched people go through generational curses to where I, I watched a family struggle and then they would have children. Those children would grow up and those children would have the same struggle as their parents. And then those children would have children and they'd grow up and they would have the same struggle as the ones before them. Have you ever seen a generational curse where it just seems like everyone in the family has the same issue? It doesn't matter how many times they try that everybody just seems to fall right back into the same issue over and over and over and over. Well, God sent me here today to tell you, you don't have to be stuck. God sent me here today to tell you there is a way out of your struggle. God sent me here today to tell you that you can break a generational curse. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to break a generational curse. You outlive a generational curse. What do you mean, that I have to live longer than the curse? No, 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 no. You outlive it this way. You see, Satan cannot curse what God has blessed. And people who live out curses are people who believe they're cursed. People who live out curses are people who have accepted a victim's mentality and they believe that they have no choice than to be that way. They believe that they have no choice that this is how my people were and their people were and their people were and that's just how we are. Well, as long as you keep believing that's just how you are, that's how you're going to be. As long as you keep believing that there is no way out of fear, you will stay in fear for the rest of your life. As long as you keep believing that you were meant to struggle, that you were designed to fail, as long as you keep believing that, 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 that God has raised you up and, and that your life is wasted and that, that you've been set up for misery, if you believe that, guess what? Misery is going to follow you the rest of your life. But how about the one that says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want? 
He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. How about that one? How about the one that says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And yea, thou walk to the valley of the shadow of death. I'm not going to fear any, any evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Why, you're going to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You're going to anoint my head with oil. My cup's going to run over. How about that promise? Surely goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life and I plan on going to church for the rest of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How about that promise? How about all the things that God spoke over you that he said that was for you? How about those promises, those prophecies that God spoke over your life that you are that close to giving up because you're in pain? How about those things that you've almost stopped believing in because of the pain or the circumstances that you have found yourself in? I want to submit to you a different way of thinking. First of all, I want you to understand that Proverbs 23 and 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the first thing you have to change is the way you think. The first thing you have to change is the way you feel about yourself, the way you feel about your family, the way you feel about your future. You have to change that. Because here's what happens most of the time. We get upset, we get hurt, and instead of speaking blessings, instead of speaking prophecy into the darkness and prophesying to the dead bones, we stand there and complain about the dead bones. We say, oh, look how dry it is. Look how dark it is. Look how dreary it is. Look how." And before you know it, we are helping. We are speaking death into something we should be speaking life into. And we are speaking death into something that was meant to live, but yet we're helping to kill it because we just keep speaking death over it and we keep speaking death over it. And we keep speaking. Instead of complaining about the darkness, somebody just needs to light a candle and say, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? If God be for me, who can be against me? Somebody just needs to put the light of the world in the midst of a darkened place, stand their ground, and claim victory in Jesus and see God win the battle. There are some battles that you weren't even supposed to fight that you're fighting right now. There are some battles in your life that God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He said, this battle is not yours, it's mine. The problem with us in our battles is that we forget, and I'll get to the scripture in a moment, is that we forget that our warfare is not with flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual wickedness in high places. And when we start taking on people, we start fighting battles that we were not supposed to fight. We start getting distracted from the real battle. So God wants you to understand this about your blessing. If you believe you're blessed and you accept your blessing and you start walking out your blessing, Satan can't curse what God has blessed. That cancels your curse right there. You don't, have to, you don't have to shout at it or scream at it or throw oil on it or anything like that. You don't have to do any of that to break a curse. All you have to do is start living right, living the good life. All you got to do is start walking toward heaven with your Bible in your hand and claiming the glory of the Lord around you. Guess what? Light disperses the darkness. It's automatic. Your light will disperse the darkness around you. Everything Satan does comes from a place of hiding. Everything he does, he works and lurks in dark places. He whispers in dark corners. But once you shine the light on it, once you open up everything to the light of Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness, there is no place for them to operate once they've been exposed. So keep this in mind. There are two verses of Scripture that deal with walking in victory by choice. Everyone say, by choice. These two verses are the verses that I want to give you. One is a story, a great story in the Bible about a man who killed a lion on a snowy day by the name of Benaiah. The other is a great passage that, sh that shows you how to use a spiritual sword. So you've got to keep in mind that this man goes into a pit, kills a lion with a sword... And now God is saying, trap your enemy in a circle and go in after him and don't come out until you kill him with a sword. So this is what we're going to deal with today. I'm first of all going to tell you a story about a lion chaser, a lion killer, 
And after we celebrate what Benaiah did, I hope that God turns you into a lion chaser and a lion killer and that you learn how to trap the lion and then walk in there with a sword and devour the thing that wants to devour you. How many of you are ready for all this word this morning? Now in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 20, I want you to look at this passage I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I am going to read one verse. Verse 20 is the one that I want you to read, and I'll tell you the rest of the story. And I'm only going to pull a portion of verse 20 out, but you can read all of these three verses, and it tells you about this man, briefly about this mighty man of David. David was kind of like the Old Testament Robin Hood. He was the guy that would go in and take on an army with 30 guys. And, and these men got known as his valiant men, and so he had the top three mighty men of David. And this man wasn't even in the top three, but he was in the top 30. He was one of David's 30 mighty fighting men. But he was trying to excel to the top by being a great warrior. So in this scripture it says, and, and I'll, I'll back up. Let me go ahead and read just verse 20 for you. Benaiah was the son of Jehada, who was a, a, he was a priest, if you look him up. He was the son of a valiant man from Kebzil who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab, and he also had gone down. Everyone say, gone down. Now, you've got to get that part because that means he went after him. That means that the lion didn't come after him. It means he went after the lion. He had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I am ready today to jump into a pit with a lion. Now, we don't know how the story played out. We don't know if he had walked into a pit and he had gone down and he happened to come across the lion trap there. Or if he saw the lion and jumped into the pit and drew his sword to say, you're not taking any more of our children, but I'll take your head off today. We don't know how it happened, but I want you to see this. He was in the pit with an enemy. He was in the pit with a lion. And all of a sudden, he sees the breath of this lion on this cold, snowy day rise up. And he locked eyes with the lion. When he locked eyes with the lion, both of them had to make a choice. The lion said, I think I'll have you for dinner. But Benaiah said, I think I'll climb out of this pit with you on my shoulders and wear you for winter. I think that one of us is going to lose this battle. But whatever happens... Both of us will not come out of here alive. I'm coming into the pit. I'm coming in with a sword. And regardless of what happens, I will not let you kill me. Now here's where I want you to pay close attention. There are some of you in this room right now who are dying a little every day by enemies that would like to devour you. The Bible says the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And from that roaring lion, there are people whose hearts are dying, whose minds are dying. There are people who have given up on fear. People who have given, into, given up on family. People have given up on all kinds of areas where God intended for them to win. But they're worn out because it's like wherever I go, I end up back here. No matter how hard I fight, I end up back here. I push to the front. I always end up back here. And God says, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting if you keep doing what you're doing you're gonna keep getting what you're getting it's time to change the game it's time to chase the lion down trap him in a pit and say, you will never stalk my neighborhood again. 
You will never come to my house again. I'm tired of seeing you in my grandmother's generation. I'm tired of seeing you in my mother's generation. I'm tired of seeing you in my children, in my generation. And I will not let you make it to the babies. I promise you today something is going to die. And the only thing between me and my enemy is a sword. And I plan to charge you with a sword. How many of God's people have actually charged their enemy with a sword? Now, here is this man, Benaiah. Here is the first thing that I notice about this man that really, really amazes me. First of all, he he is a lion chaser. And and what sets lion chasers apart isn't the outcome. It's the courage to chase. It's the courage that sets them apart. It doesn't mean that I am a hero because I want to fight. It means I'm a hero because I got in the fight. I am not a winner because you lost or an enemy lost. I am a winner because I decided to stand up and do something about it, and I won the fight. See, there's a difference in lion chasers, people running from their fears and people running to their fears. Notice that every time in the Bible that God raises up a champion, he runs into the battle. David in a slingshot, what do he do? He back in the corner and just take his bead and hide behind the, 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 hide behind a bush? No, he ran toward the giant. And as he ran into battle, the giant said, you send a boy with, look at this, you send a boy with sticks and stones after me, it threw him off. He was ready for everything except a rock between the eyes. He was ready for everything. But because a champion stood up and faced down and charged down an enemy, they were able to take the battle and win the battle. See, lion chasers are people that have courage. And courage does not mean that you are not afraid, but courage means you're going to do something in the midst of your fear. Courage means I have chosen not to give over to my fears. Because there's a passage in Zechariah that talks about a roaring lion running through the camp and destroying people. Listen to this. I've preached on this in a little book that I wrote called Stricken Shepherds and Scattered Sheep. But, But listen to this. There is the sound of wailing shepherds for their glory. That means all my hard work is ruined. It's ruined. All my work in this family is ruined. All my work in this ministry is ruined. My glory is in ruins. Not God's glory is in ruins, but the glory of all the work. My glory is in ruins. Why? Because there is a lion that came into the pride and began to pick them off one by one. And that wailing shepherd, I don't have time to go into the rest of this, but I love to preach that sermon to where sometimes God raises up somebody to take out a lion or to take out a bear or there's another sermon for another day. But someone has to either, we either run from the lion or we take him on. We either run from our fear or we make a stand. The people in the old school used to say, stand on the word. I I like that phrase, don't you? I wish a lot more people talk like that right now and said, listen, I I know it doesn't look good for me right now, but I'm standing on the word. You don't have to worry about me. I'm standing on the word. I want to tell you, if you ever come across a word-carrying believer, they're dangerous. Yeah, they shout like no one else shouts. They praise like no one else prays. They pray like no one else prays. Other people, they're just kind of got their groove on and their little rhythm with Jesus and everything is nice. Not a word-carrying believer. Uh Uh-uh, they'll run right over you because they believe that victory is in sight. God has given them a promise. They are claiming a promise. They're claiming a prophecy over their life. And no matter what you say to them, you try to talk them out of their victory, you cannot talk them out of the victory. I know what you said, but God said. I I know what you mean. I know you mean well but what you don't know is the Lord has already come to my house and he's already told me the house is going to be fine well I I know what it looks like right now but what you don't understand is that I have a promise hanging over my head for my children and I know they may not be doing everything they need to be doing right now but God already showed me them in the pulpit God already showed me them in the choir God's already showed me my children in the altar I don't know when that day is going to come but the one thing I do know is God is not a man that 
he can lie. And God will do what he says he will do. God doesn't need anyone's permission to bless me. And I'm not going to let anybody talk me out of my blessing. I'm not going to let anyone talk me out of my promise. Because I'm standing on a word. Yeah, I know what it looks like. But I'm standing on a word. I know it doesn't seem right. But I'm standing on a word. I know it looks like it's all going downhill. But I'm standing on a prophecy. I'm standing on a promise. And people who stand on a word are one sword away from their victory. Can you give God praise this morning? Hallelujah. We have to have a few giant or lion chasers among us. People that say, wait a minute, this is my church. Uh-uh, not in my church. Uh-uh. Somebody that says, oh, this is my family. No way. You pick on somebody else's family, but you have knocked on the wrong door this time. Uh-huh. Because if, you know what, you come in this house. I heard a guy say the other day he was talking about gun control. He said, you come in my house in the middle of the night, you're going to die of lead poisoning. You know what, I, I think that somebody needs to say, the devil come knocking on my door, I'm going to cut your head off with a sword. That's just how it's going to be. You're going to come in my house, I'm going to cut your head off with a sword because God has already promised life in this house, life evermore. God has already, already promised life in our house. Our children are going to be blessed. Our future is going to be blessed. We're not giving that up now. No way. Over a lion, I think not. We will take out the lion before we give up our treasure. We will take out the lion before we give up the house. We will take out the lion before we give up all of the promises that God has pronounced over our house. So he said, just because there's a lion doesn't mean the battle's lost. Just because there's a fight. You see, sometimes God positions you strategically in the right place at the right time. And the whole problem with that is that it doesn't always look like the right place at the right time. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It looks like you're in the wrong place at the wrong time because you're in a pit with a lion. I, want, I need to let that sink in just a little, just a little bit. It looks like you're in the wrong place at the wrong time because you're in a pit with a lion. But God has trapped you in a room with an enemy so that you would never have to deal with that enemy again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a setup. Turn to someone and say, sometimes problems are just a setup. God is strategically placing me in a place to win. How can I win without a battle? How can I win without a sword in my hand? Yes, it's time for me to get a sword in my hand. This battle is my edge of victory, not my place of defeat. You see, your prayers and your prophecies are the best predictors of your future. What if God gave you everything that comes out of your mouth? How many of you would be happy with that? Don't raise your hand too quick. <laughs> I don't think I would be. I'm just so thankful that he's wiser than I am. And that, that he knows that I'm just so thankful that he speaks over my life. Because if God gives me everything I ever spoke into existence, we all in trouble. <laughs> because I have my days just like you have your days. Now there are days I want God to give me everything that comes out of my mouth. But here's the thing. I still don't know my future. So even though, even when I'm telling God how to run his business and my business, I still don't know what God's up to some of those times. I could say, God, now you're supposed to be doing it like this, and it's supposed to be happening like this, and if it just happened like this, it'd all be all right. And God says, mm-hmm, since when did you know how to run the kingdom better than me? See, that, that's why sometimes we have to realize that we need to be seeking God and not just seeking answers. Because sometimes we start seeking answers and, and we're so zeroed in on the answers that we're not seeking God and His presence. And sometimes God says, seek me, seek and you shall find me. 
Knock and the door shall be opened. So prayer is not just about uh, prayer is not just about God getting me on that. Guys, go to that place on the screen, if you will. I want you to you, you should be two slides ahead. I want you to go to the one that says that we shouldn't seek answers. I, I want them to see this. Look at that. We shouldn't seek answers as much as we should seek God, because if we're just seeking answers. A lot of times we completely lose our way in the battle instead of saying, okay, God, not my will but thine be done. Okay, God, I'm tired of talking. I'm ready, I'm ready to start listening. I'm tired of telling you how to run my life. I'm ready for you to tell me how to run my life. Lord, I'm, I'm tired of stop. I, I'm, I'm tired of asking you to bless what I'm doing, and I'm ready to start doing what you're blessing. Lord, Lord I'm, I'm, I'm tired of telling you how to make my life okay. Okay, when I just need to seek you, get your presence around me, let you order my steps with your word, and know that everything is going to work out okay. Can you give God praise this morning? Amen. Here's the next thing I want you to notice about this. The next thing I see in the scripture is that this lion is trapped in a circle. It's trapped in a, in a pit. You see, sometimes we need to draw circles around our problem. Here's how we pray a lot of times. We pray according to how we feel. And so we hit and miss. We're, we're, we're shooting at this today and this tomorrow and this the next day. And this. Sometimes we need to get it all up, get, in that, get the problem in the middle, and trap it. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever been trapping before? I know, I know all the animal enthusiasts, you don't want me to talk about this this morning, but uh, it's just for a matter of uh, illustration. Um, my father-in-law loved to eat turtles, believe it or not, and he and I would trap turtles. And we would go out to this place that he liked called Spring Creek down in the swamps of southern Georgia, and we would, we would set up a circle net we would go in early in the morning, and we would tack it onto a log, and then we would float it out and anchor it. So there was a trap, but the turtles didn't know it. Well, the turtles would get up there and sunbathe, and John knew exactly when those turtles would be on that log. I, I don't know how he knew it, but he could smell turtle. At least he said he could. And so we would take the boat, and we would go to the other side of the log. We'd go out there and fish for a while, and then we would head back. And he said, all right, you ready to eat some turtles tonight? All right, John, whatever you say, you know, I'm not sure what we're doing here. He would come in behind those turtles and just run that boat toward them. You wouldn't hit them. They would get scared of the boat and jump off right into the net. He said, boy, that was easy fishing, wasn't it? Go by and pick up the net and take it home. Sometimes we have to trap an enemy in order to take care of it. Sometimes we keep trying to fix this and we try to fix that and we try to fix this. And God says that in this particular story, the lion was trapped and then he was able to go in and seize it. Well, how do I do that, Pastor? That sounds good in a Benaiah's story, but how about my story? Okay. You need to put your problem in the middle, and you need to build you a prayer circle around that problem, and you need to keep speaking into it and praying into it until something breaks, until something lets go and you see a victory. If that's your daughter, put your daughter in the middle. If that's your wife, put your wife in the middle. If that's your church, put your church in the middle. If that's your finances, put your finances in the middle. If that's your addiction, put your addiction in the middle. If that's your temper, put your temper in the middle, whatever it is. If that's your depression, put your depression in the middle and say, listen, we are not letting up this time. Something's going to die here today and it's not going to be me. I am not coming out of here without a winter coat. I am not coming out of here until I slay this lion. I am trapping you. I'm dealing with you once and for all. I'm not going to skirt the issues. If it means battle, it means battle. But today we do the dance. Today is the day of the duo. Today, I've decided to take you on. I'm tired of talking about it to anybody who wants to listen. I'm tired of just telling one more person, thinking it's going to make me feel better, only to end up in the same spot next week. I'm tired of doing the same little prayer that I keep doing. No, today, I'm getting you in the middle, and I am going to focus and target the word on you. I'm going to put the light in the middle. I'm going to get out my sword, and I'm coming in after you until something changes and breaks loose in my life. Hallelujah. 
Give God praise this morning. Sometimes we have to draw circles around our problem and attack it. We have to focus some concentrated firepower on it. Get some people to pray. Get some people to believe. Get some people around you who can speak the word and speak life into the situation that you're dealing with. There's a scripture in the Bible that tells us how to handle a sword. Because if you're going to trap an enemy, you need to go in there with a sword. Don't go in there by yourself. I don't care how long your fingernails are. Don't take on a bear or a lion. Take a sword in there with you. I, I want you to look at another scripture with me this morning. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 10. Look, look at this passage, and I'm not going to read all of it, but I want you to see because this is a scripture that tells me how to handle myself in a battle. And we're going to go through this quite quickly, but look at this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against. Everyone say, stand against. See, at some point in time, I have to make a stand against the thing that has been coming against my life and my family. He said that we may be able to stand against. Now, I want you to look at the next verse. It's very important. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness. Everybody say the word darkness. Now, here, here's what you need to know about this passage. This passage tells you how to identify uh, the difference in just a health problem and a spiritual attack. Just an emotional issue and a spiritual attack. Because the attack is coming from darkness. Okay, okay, I get that part, Pastor, but what does that look like in real life? Uh, let's go to the next screen. I want you to see something. In this, in, this, in this screen, it tells you that you can identify a spiritual attack by where it's coming from. From, notice in verse 12, it said that all of these things are coming from dark places. So how do I identify the work of a principality? Well, let's look at dark places. Whispering, dark corners, rumors, gossiping, all those things. When everyone's got lots of secrets and everyone's, and it's, there's nothing out in the open. There's nothing out in the light. That's, that's when you know it's the work of the enemy. Because once you shine the light onto darkness, it dissipates the darkness. It, once you put the light on it, there is nowhere to hide. So when you, see, when you see the enemy at work, it works through divisive spirits, slandering and putting this down, you know, whispering and, and talking about this, but never really confronting it, never really dealing with it, you know, talking about it in the side rooms, but never really taking it on, never, never, really, never really going out there and saying, okay, I see a line in this room. Does anyone else see the line in this room? You know, have, have you ever been in a room before and it's like, am I the only one who sees what's going on in this room? Have you ever been in that room before? It's like everybody's skirting the issue. Nobody wants to talk about the real issue. Somebody has just sucked all the air out of the room with the problems. And it's like, mm, this is supposed to be the holiday. And I mean, could this wait till tomorrow? And I mean, and then you realize, and nobody wants to take it on. It's like, well, let's not say anything. It's just going to make them upset. It's just going to get, you know, it's just going to make it worse. So we never deal with it. The Lord says, you keep doing what you're doing. You're going to keep getting what you're getting. Maybe it's time to take it on straightforward. Maybe it's time to trap the lion and go in with a sword. Okay, how do I do that, Pastor? Let's keep going. Now, you identify where it's coming from, from dark places. Look at verse 13. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Notice how many times that word stand keeps coming up. Stand, therefore, having girded about the waist with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. It talks about, and then look at the next verse in verse 7. Let's go down to verse 17. There we go. And take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? The word of God. Wait a minute. Okay, so he's, he told me three times to stand. Okay, I'm there. I'm here now. Three times he said, stand. And the next thing he says is, don't just stand, but stand with a sword. Just like Benaiah, 
went into the pit with a lion. I'm standing with a sword. But what is my sword? It is the Word of God. Now here's something I want you to notice in these next few verses. Look at everything that has to do with speaking in the next couple of verses. Praying always with prayer. Supplication. Look at verse 19. That utterance may be given to me. That I may open my mouth boldly verse 20 that i may be uh, that i may speak as i ought to speak notice this if i am going to fight my battle i cannot keep cursing the darkness with curses if i'm going to fight my battle i can't keep speaking against my enemy thinking that flesh and blood is going to win me anything if i am going to win my battle i have to make a stand with a word I have to make my stand. Oh, hallelujah. I just, I just feel this all in my spirit this morning. I need to make a stand, a final stand, and say, Lord, I don't have anything else to stand on but your word. But I am convinced that your word is enough. I am convinced that if everything else fell, if kings fell and armies fell, I believe that the word of God will not return void and the word of God will stand. I think that when heaven and earth passes away, there's only one thing that's going to stand and that is the word of the living God. Now, Lord, if you said you could send your word to heal them, I need a word that I can stand on. If you said that you could send forth a word into a king's mind and call him to run an army into a Red Sea. I need a word to stand on, Lord. If you told me that you could send forth your word to Nebuchadnezzar and put him back in his right mind, I need a word to stand on. If you tell me that you can send a rumor to Pharaoh and cause him to lose his entire kingdom over it, then God, I need a word that can kill the lion of my life. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of discussing it. I'm tired of getting people involved in it. I'm ready to win. Win. I need to wedge something in between me and my enemy. I need something that can break my chains loose, God. I need a wedge, something between me, a barrier between me and the enemy of my life. God, give me a word. Turn to someone and say, God needs to give us a word. Now understand this. Here's the difference in your word and God's word. Here's the difference. Look, look, at, look at Hebrews uh, uh, 4 just for a moment with me. Hebrews 4 and 12. Listen to what this says. For the word of God. Everyone say word of God. Word of God. Listen to what it is. First of all, it's living. Shout living. living. It's powerful. Say powerful. powerful. It's sharper. Say sharper. sharper. Now, how many of you think your word's like that? Uh-uh. My word is not living. I'm powerful and sharper. My word's wishy-washy. I mean, you know, my word, that's your word. You know, it's according to how we feel. It's according to what with the sun shining or if it's raining outside, what kind of word we speak. No, no, but the word of God, it stands forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not the word of God. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Here's the difference in God's word and your word. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. What I have right here is a two-edged sword. It's sharper than this. I can kill a physical enemy with this, but only a spiritual enemy can be killed with a different kind of sword. Not this kind. Uh-uh. That word can divide my soul and my spirit. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you need a word. This is going to sound a little crazy, but just bear with me. I promise you I won't leave you there. Sometimes you need a word to cut your head off. What do you mean? To separate your thoughts from what you know is right. Sometimes you need to separate your brain from your spirit because you're fighting things here in your emotions and in your mind and you can't get what that person said out of your head and this person said out of your head. And you're fighting all that. And God says, listen, I've already, put, I've already written it down. Do what my word says. Seek me and find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, you're going to find me. God says there's a difference in what your word can do and what my word can do. Because my word will separate your soul from your spirit. My word can divide your thoughts from the intent of your heart. You ever had good intentions and bad things come out of your mouth? And you think, I didn't mean to say that. 
Am I the only one? I don't think so. Uh, I, I just didn't mean to say that. My heart was in the right place, but my mouth was in the wrong place. I mean, that happens to me more than I want to admit. You know, I, my heart was in the right place, but I just didn't articulate it as well as I wanted to. God says that in your spiritual battle, in your prayer life, in your supplication, when you're fighting the spiritual battle, when you just begin to speak forth the Word of God instead of your own words, and you just begin to pray forth Scriptures, and you just begin to speak forth Scriptures over your life, when you begin to pray Scriptures instead Instead of saying, okay, God, I want you to do this, just say, Lord, your will, not my will, but thine be done. Just speak a word over it. Even when you have nothing to say, nothing to pray about, just speak a word over your life. He said it can discern between heart and soul, between the thoughts and intents of the heart. And look at this. When you get a word between you and your enemy, it will begin to divide something. Now, I don't do much wood chopping anymore, but I've done quite a bit in my day. And, and uh, when, I was, when, I, when I grew up as a young man back in Tennessee, we had to split wood all the time. Any of you guys still splitting wood out there? All right, that's a tough job. That's a tough job. Here's what I remember about splitting wood. The, the little wood was kind of fun to split with the axe, but when you get a great big log, we had to use a wedge. Now they got hydraulic ones and all that fun stuff now. But back in that day, we had to get a sledgehammer. Anybody remember that? A sledgehammer and a wedge. And you know what you'd do? You would tap that thing in as best as you could and sometimes bust your hand getting it in there. And you'd finally get that tapped in. And guess what? It wouldn't split the log. You'd have to hit it again and say, well, it didn't split. Hit it again, and you just keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it and pounding it. And after a while, that wedge goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you start hearing something popping and cracking. And before you know it, you have taken a huge log with a sledgehammer and a wedge, and you have busted that log right in half. Sometimes you need to take a word in your life, and you say, Lord, I've spoken this word, but I need to speak it again. And you need to hammer it and hammer it and let it go deeper and deeper. I'm going to say it again until something cracks. I'm going to say it again until I hear something pop. I'm going to say it again until something gives. I'm going to say it again until something gets loose. I'm going to say it again until it loosens up. I'm just going to keep speaking it and speaking it and speaking it and speaking it and speaking it until the very thing that was too big for you breaks in half, not from your word, but because you drove a sword into it. Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, I need a word. Well, I can tell you it's not as hard as you think. Because God doesn't have to get you, God does not have to send you through a prayer line and put enough oil on your head to crank a bus to give you a word. How many of you know that? Yeah. Everything here is his word. Well, Pastor, how do I stand on the word? I, I don't have to have just a word. No, stand on God's word. I don't have to have somebody to tell me everything I need to hear in order for me to get my victory. Let me just show you. Let's start elementary, all right? I'll start over in the baby food section just to go easy on you a little bit. Let's go to the psalm and sing a little song, okay? Let's just start here with a psalm and see, see if that helps us. How many of you could live on something like this? I'm just going to start Psalm 1, just easy, just go easy on you. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That man will be like a tree that is planted by rivers of water. He shall bring forth his fruit in his season. Well, I could just live on that one right there. I will bring forth my fruit in my season. I will meditate on God's word day and night. He said, look, at, look I'm just reading the first three verses. I mean, we're not even deep yet. We're just kind of on the surface. He says, and whatever he does shall prosper. Wow. I mean, we have, we're still in the Gerber section. Uh, you just keep going. Uh, let's just flip over a few pages because it's all good. How about this one? This is Psalm 8. He said, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you've ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visited him? You've made us a little lower than the angels and you have crowned us with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet. I could take that one home with me and sweep the floor with it. 
right there. I could take that home and say, sweep every principality right out of the house with that one right there. Listen, God has ordained that I'm going to prosper. God's ordained I'm not going to miss my season. God has ordained that I'm going to have fruit in my next season. God has ordained that, 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 the, that even though I've been created lower than the angels, that he's put all things under my feet, that my praise will silence my enemies. He said, from the mouths of babes and infants, thou have ordained praises. That scripture was fulfilled later on when Jesus was in the temple and the children came in saying, Hosanna. He said, today this scripture is fulfilled, meaning that if all you got to pray, just stand there and give him a praise. And a praise all by itself can give you victories that nothing else can get you. Okay, well, I can see that some of you still need something deeper than that, something richer than that, because you're holier and you're stronger and you're more righteous. So here we go. Sink your teeth into this one and send it home to the devil. The pains of death surrounded me. Mind your neighborhood yet? The pains of death surrounded me. The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of hell surrounded me. Anybody ever been there? You been there? But in my distress, <laughs> I called upon the Lord, and he heard my cry. He heard my voice. This is Psalm 18. He heard my voice in the midst of his temple, and my cry came before him right to his very ears. And God rode upon a cherub, and he did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind, and darkness was under his pavilion. He made a canopy of dark waters under him, and from the brightness of the clouds that went before him, and coals of fire came out of his mouth. The Lord thundered from the heavens, and hailstones fell from the sky. He sent forth arrows as lightning in abundance, and he sent for me, and he took me out of that situation. He took me out of those waters and delivered me from my strong enemy oh I can live on that I can live on that oh God in my distress I call you and you hear me well you can even flip over another page I mean you don't even have to go far to get your word no may the Lord answer you in the day of your trouble may the name of God of Jacob defend you may he send you help from above and strengthen you may he remember all your offerings well I already told you if all you've ever given him is a praise he'll fight your battles for you and now God said if you've ever given him the offering I've still got your name on my book I mean if all you if all you've done is give Given God a few offerings, he said, I'll still go to war with you because you are mine and you are my children and I will fight your battles. Well, how about, you know what, we can yield our own sword. How about if God be for you, who can be against you? How about no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper and every tongue that rises against me thou shalt condemn for this is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. How about he was wounded for my transgression and bruised for my iniquity, the chastisement of my peace is upon him and by his stripes I am healed how about the mercies of the Lord are renewed every day and great is his faithfulness hallelujah hallelujah if I can just get me a word and stand on it I can break something loose in my life and get myself free stand all over the house this morning Isaiah 54 says that all of your children will be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. Somebody needs to go to bed on that one every night. Lord, I will not let a lion roar in my house. I will not let an enemy live in my yard. Today I've decided... To go into a pit on a snowy day and take out a lion who has been roaring in my village. I'm going to make myself a winter coat. Oh, hallelujah. There's a choice here. There's a choice here. Do I run in fear? Do I let myself get devoured or do I stand with the sword? Backed into a corner, but with a sword. Can't help where I'm at, but I got a sword. I'm in a pit with a lion, 
But today is going to be a day of victory. In a pit with a lion. Some people would call that a death sentence. I call it a setup. Today, the Lord and I are going to fight a battle that I'm tired of talking about. Whew, praise God. How do I get free? I got to get a sword in my mouth. I got to get a word in my mouth and I got to speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it. No more whispering in the corners. No more talking in the darkness. No, 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 no. Today we face the lion. Today we speak life over everything we declare God said could live. Amen. Give God praise one more time. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need you to do one thing this morning. I need for you to respond on your own to the Lord. I, I know that we make it really easy. We have the elders to come and the staff to come. But there are some things you just got to go get for yourself. And today, this is how I feel the Lord wants us to end this last, uh, in, in this sermon today. Is I feel like today, if you need a word, and you're just willing to, to go to the Lord and say, God, you know what, here's the thing you need to understand. It's all a sword. You don't have to have a specific one that somebody gave you and the room spins and, you know, you saw blood on the wall and angels twirling. You don't have to get all that just to get, get, get free. Uh-uh. Stand on the word. Stand on God's word. All of it is good. All of it is good. Get you a sword and speak it. So if you say, Pastor, I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of being worn out. I'm tired of fighting and ended up in the same place. Today, I'm declaring my freedom. Today, I'm going into the pit, but with a sword. I'm backed in a corner, but I've got a sword. Today, I'm going after my word. If that's you, out of, out of an act of obedience, your first step toward your freedom, as they begin to sing this song, I want you to get out of your seats, come to the balconies, come from the back of the church, all over the place, and I just want you to stand in the front and allow the Holy Spirit to just give you comfort and peace. And then, and then let God give you, whether you get your word today or tomorrow, whenever you get a word that fits your situation, hammer it in and hammer it in until something breaks. You already know it's bigger than you, but it's not bigger than God. Would you come right now all over this room? Everybody that says, I'm ready to win. I'm ready to fight this and win.